From my understanding, the essential problems with epistemology derive from the nature of language and axioms upon which various underlying linguistic structures are based and then afterwards interpreted. As you have said in your videos, the probability that you construe some of the same definitions of insert random word in the same way are virtually zero. One of the best examples I can give for this is the language that is used in physics. It is widely misconstrued as the pragmatic meanings behind words in their context are worlds debased from the vague linguistic constructed views of the actual definitions. Such is the problem with the word dimension. It is understood in a more semantic sense, but not in the abstract sense in which the word is implied. Einstein stresses that geometry is an abstract model. Time per se is not a dimension. The theory of special relativity merely treats any one clock time as dimension of an abstract construct. So for Okay, so, so my answer to that fundamentally, I think the best answer to that was provided by the American pragmatists, and that would be William James and his crew. That would include a guy named per Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E, -E, who was perhaps the best philosopher that the U.S. ever produced, C.S. Pierce, but who's somewhat underappreciated and was, was certainly so in his own life. Part of the way that different people hone in on the same definition is to define what an acceptable outcome would be to their joint interactions and then to hone their language until they achieve that outcome and then to consider that good enough and see pierce and his crew basically said that you could never do anything better than that so let's say that we're trying to we're trying to communicate about how we're going to move a wheelbarrow full of bricks from one side of the yard to the other well basically what we've decided is we've communicated good enough if the bricks get moved so what you have to do is you have to set up a practical surround in some sense around your conversation and that that practical surround constitutes what you are willing to consider as proof that conversation or that communication has taken place sufficiently. It's complicated. It's partly why the robotics engineers types like Rodney Brooks discovered back in the 1980s that you really couldn't have intelligent machines without embodiment because you need a real-world target against which to measure the, the uh, effectiveness of your communication. Because, as you said, I mean, this is where the postmodernists have it right, is that there is a lot of different ways of interpreting everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when your interpretation is good enough? And the answer to that is, you agree a priori what would constitute good enough. And when you hit that target, then you're done. All right, thank you. And I'll look into C.S. Yep. Pierce. Okay. Yep, C.S. Pierce, yep. And Look then, up the American pragmatists. They got it right, man. And then the next one is on transgenderism. Conservatives strongly boast a biological and scientific claim of two genders. They believe, and I believe rightfully so, in biological differences between males and females. And from my perspective, I think I could partially combat this, but it's an argument that hasn't been raised from the liberal side. Biological differences in the brain. Women can see more shades of color on average, and men have better spatial orientation on average. There's massive neurological and biological differences between yes. men and women. They're well documented, but the, the postmodernist types just assume that the scientists who conducted the investigations are suffering from the same bias that they think permeates everything else, so they just discount it. So is it really crazy to believe that someone could be born with biological similarities to an XY brain and biological XX No, no not at all, y. not at all. Look, okay. th th that isn't the argument that I'm making. All right. The argument that I'm making is that uh, gender identity is strongly influenced by biological sex. Okay. And th the problem is, is that the legislation, especially the legislation that's being introduced in Canada, argues that it's not. Yes. And that's just not helpful. It's not even helpful for the transgender types, because some of them, for sure, there are people who have mixed biological sex. You know, sure. There are women who have some cells in their body that have male chromosomes. Yes. And then it's not a trivial number, for example. And there are people who are born with genitalia that aren't identifiable, and there are more genuine hermaphroditic types. And there's no different, no doubt that there are some men that have a more feminine personality structure and some women that have a more masculine personality structure, and that that's biologically influenced. I'm not making a biological case that there are two genders that end. I'm making a case that sexual identity is unbelievably powerfully influenced by biology with certain exceptions, and that those exceptions themselves might be biologically determined, not in all cases, but in many. And so 
part of the reason I was objecting to legislation like Bill C-16 is because it insists that gender identity is socially constructed. Well, if gender identity is socially constructed, then why can't we just take transgender people and socialize them back into their into their normative sex roles? Exactly. Right, exactly. So that's part of the reason I was objecting to the legislation. Yes. One of the most powerful arguments, and I, I said this, I, I did a presentation in front of the Canadian Senate. I don't know if you saw that or not. And there's no reason for you to have paid attention to it. But if you look up Jordan Peterson and Senate, you'll see that along with a practicing lawyer, I made exactly that case to a number of Canadian senators telling them that by supporting this legislation, they were actually doing a disservice to the people that they purported to be helping. It isn't that biologically there are two sexes, although as an approximation, that's true. It gets slightly messy because there are multiplicity of ways that sexuality, that sex differences manifest themselves. And there's a fair bit of variability across all of those different manifestations. And so, as I said, you can have feminine man and a masculine male, a masculine woman. That happens very frequently. Um, it's just more often you have a feminine woman and a masculine man. You say that you see scientific realism is nested in Darwinian competition. Liber no, 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 that's not quite right. Okay. No, I, I would say that it isn't obvious to me that there is any truth that is superordinate to the truth that's established in a Darwinian fashion. And that includes our notion of, of objective reality. Now, that's where Sam Harris and I had a major disagreement. But yes. again, it has it's a consequence of my pragmatic thinking, you see. The Darwinian claim fundamentally is that the only way that you can come up with a definition of truth is through an, an evolutionary model that uses death as the punishment. And so one of the things I was arguing with, with Sam Harris about is, is whether or not our current conceptualizations of objective truth are necessarily true in a Darwinian sense. And if they're not, which form of truth should take priority? And I was arguing that Darwinian truth should always take priority. And Sam was arguing that well, mm -hmm. he didn't particularly like that stance, although one of the, well, and that's basically what our argument circulated around. You see, the problem is, is that we never know. Let's see, what's the problem exactly? Even our objective truth is seriously bounded in ways that we don't understand. Yes. And claim, claim it at, at any given moment as having some sort of fundamental ontological status outside of its Darwinian utility strikes me as dangerous, especially given how transmutable scientific theories tend to be. If I'm going to oversimplify things, I'm going yeah. to say that liberals tend to think with the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain, with future applications, <laughs> possibilities, likeliness, consequences. And conservatives... You know, that's also the part of the brain that's involved in social cognition, eh? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. conservatives so that's, that's tend to think with you. So, um, here, I'm going to read what I wrote here. For example, low populations in rural areas would potentially possess more views of self-autonomy, working hard, family values, increasing population, protecting oneself and one's kind due to the types of motivations in the hyperthalamus being more applicable to survival, while highly populated areas would focus potentially more on thinking, tolerance, community values, stabilizing population, but additionally might not focus so much on protecting life or raising children. These differences could explain vastly the moral behaviors being ideally or objectively true based on incalculable variables. Better run, run that one through me again. Find me again. It's quite complicated. I am suggesting that if we are to look at how people think, yeah. um, we can look at how people think as being nested in Darwinian competition. So, yeah, right. so if there's a low populated area, you would think, okay, what traits yeah. would be necessary for them to be raised, mostly in the hyperthalamus, I'm assuming, and what traits would be more applicable for a large city. So it's almost completely possible that the politics of liberals is perfect for their situation in a big city and the politics of conservatives is... Yeah, it's, good. it's a good hypothesis. It's one that you should think about. Like, it, it's, it is... It's, it's a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, I'd have to think it through a long time before I, because before I, you're, you're suggesting that a conservative philosophy is more useful in a, in a low populated area. Um, and a liberal philosophy. I, yeah, it's possible. It's worth thinking through. I'm not saying necessarily directly, but yeah. at least the possibility. Yeah, well, one thing you could do to, to, to some degree to begin with is just run a correlation between size of the community and, and 
political proclivity, you should be able to get that data on the line, online. It wouldn't be proof because it might be that the more liberal types are also more likely to move to the cities, right? In yes. which case, you'd be leaving conservatives behind, and it's not because they're more well adapted. Well, even then, it might be because they're more well adapted to smaller communities. It's a good idea. It's, it's worth thinking about. And we have that data just through political polls, and you'll see yeah. whenever yeah. you look at the map, it's all red because the red is in the the smaller areas, and the blue looks small because yeah. there's more people there. So it does tend to yeah, work yeah. out. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, look, it's, it's a plausible hypothesis. It might be interesting to look in the red states only and see if it's still true there. Thank you for that. I mean, it's a lot that yeah. you... One last question on religion, and I've been watching your your psychological interpretations of the Bible as well as I have read yeah. the maps of meaning. I may have missed something there. So neurophysiologically, to my understanding, the way the human brain is constructed is such that happiness is achieved in the pursuit of a noble aim rather than the attainment of the goal itself. You've talked about this multiple times. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That that you know, I would. It's not even. It's not happiness precisely, but that'll do. It's more like yeah. a sense of meaningful engagement, which I think is better than happiness. But that's okay. We can go with happiness for now. All right. If there is no noble aim, we are limited to simple pleasures, which do not sustain a positive. Yeah, that's right. You're, that's exactly yes. right. You're limited to impulsive pleasures. Yes, and and those are ones that don't necessarily have a good medium to long term outcome. So if I am to take a psychological or moral view or moral view of biblical teaching. Um, unlike yeah. a scientific view, the idea of external happiness without suffering exists as a brilliantly thought out construct which invokes a sense of purpose and happiness. And if I am to make that conclusion, can I see those concepts in the moral psychology of the Bible as manipulative? Or does the defiance of natural law rule out a literal interpretation? If I'm to assume all of this with heaven and hell, yeah. uh, eternal happiness can you see that as manipulative? You can. I mean, certainly Marx did, and I would say Freud did as well. One of the problems, because Freud thought of, you know, religion as, let's call it both manipulative and immature, because it guaranteed people the certainty of life after death, and it, it allowed them the comfort of knowing that an all-seeing father was watching over them. And Freud regarded that, let's say, as immature and man manipulative, but he didn't have a good explanation for why people came up with the idea of hell because if you were just going to go for immature and manipulative it might as well be all positive right why put the negative in there and you could say skeptically well hell is where you put your enemies but that's a really cynical interpretation because many religious people and now certainly even but certainly throughout the middle ages were terrified that hell was something that they were headed to not that their enemies were going to mm -hmm. so I don't think that that's a reasonable interpretation historically. I know Marx would say that the, that religion was would do whatever it could to manipulate people so that the power structures, the economic power structures, can stay in place. But given that religion, religious structures, and this is I would say particularly, but not only true of Christianity, have played a tremendous role in giving additional voice to the people who were downtrodden and enslaved. That that also is a historically. That's that's not a historically credible argument. Sometimes that religious teachings are used to buttress the people who are in control, and sometimes they're used to oppose them. So I don't buy that for a second. So no, I don't think the manipulation argument is a. I don't think it's a credible one. I, I mean, I understand it, and I'm an admirer of Freud, you know, but I think he got it wrong. I think he got that wrong, and that was certainly one of the places that he disagreed most profoundly with Carl Jung. And I think Jung came out of it right, and Freud came out of it wrong. And then I think the Marxist critique of religion, it's just like every other Marxist critique. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can treat religious religion, religious structures as if they're oppressive power structures only. But, you know, it, it's just a reduction of a multidimensional complexity to a, to a relatively predictable unidimensional, unidimensional phenomenon. It's, it's not helpful. It's not a helpful intellectual exercise past its immediate self-evidence. You know, because the self-evidence is some religious people are corrupt. It's like, yeah, right, obviously. That That's fair. And I'm taking one concept uh, of a huge bundle of things. There's a writer named, um, I should tell you about this guy, um, Jeffrey Burton Russell. Jeffrey Burton Russell. You'd like him. Yeah, he's written a couple of books on heaven and, and uh, uh, a very good series on the devil. As a historian, so he's a historian of the idea of heaven and the idea of the devil.
Okay. So we had three volume series on the devil. One is Mephistopheles, which I think is the best one. But if you're interested in in that kind of idea, Jeffrey Burton Russell's a good person to to take a look at. He's credible. He's a credible historian and, and I think his books are extremely interesting. So and he delves into the idea of heaven in a much more fundamental way than the typical especially the typical sort of casually religious critical postmodernist who always assumes that there's nothing to it except power dynamics. It's foolish because heaven at, at minimum is a vision of a better future. Mm-hmm. And even, mm-hmm. even as, even as only that it's, it's by no means trivial. I mean, human beings are about the only creatures that can imagine a better future. And so heaven is like the archetypal better future. Yes. And so you don't want to just demolish that idea too casually because we're always working unless we're pathological, we're always working for a better future. So, and to think of heaven as the idea that's sort of shining behind that, the, you know, the, the, the platonic ideal of the idea of a better future, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to think, and you don't want to just throw it away. That would be throwing away one of the greatest ideas of mankind. And that doesn't mean, I think, that people should be politically utopians. It's not the same thing. Yes, it's the concept that has the psychological effects on the way people behave. Yeah, well, and, yeah, that's right, and it's the concept that's of value. Like, I think the difference between the Christian idea of heaven and the political utopian idea of heaven is that for Christians, heaven is what would be achieved through the use of truth, individual truth, and for the political utopian, it would be as a consequence of the instantiation of some particular political system. No, those are not the same thing at all. Those are good questions. questions, by the way. They're really good questions. Thank you. You're one of the only people I've had faith in that could answer some of the questions I've had. Yeah, so what do you do? Are you a student? I am a student. I go in and out of school. I tend to make money when I need to and read yeah. all day. Are you What's your, what are your future plans? I want to go into academia. I want to do research. Well, you're pretty smart, you know. That's a Thank good you. plan. Those are good questions. School is expensive, and the types of schools that I, I go to are kind of boring. I Like, if I could go yeah. to your class every day, I would be the happiest person ever. The type of teachers, not that they're not intelligent, they're just not a Sam Harris or a Neil deGrasse Tyson or a Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I spend yeah. a lot of time reading reading through Einstein over and over again, or listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I like learning. The university doesn't give me... I yeah, no, I get the picture. I get the picture. It's... it's yeah, if the problem that you've got is that there's some utility in credentials. So, you know, there's always the possibility of going to university for the credentials and educating yourself at the same time. Yes. Which is what you really have to do if you go to university anyways. I know it's a, but, it, you know, it's always an uncomfortable meld between what you want and what should be and what you can get. Yes. Mark Twain says, I never let my uh, schooling interfere with my education. Well, right. <laughs> yes, exactly. That That's perfect. Yes. Have you done the future authoring program? Given given your level of, of, of let's say intellect, you you would have to have a pretty good goal to to you know it's not atypical for someone to be very smart and very open but not very conscientious. And I don't know if you're not very conscientious. Maybe you are, but what you've said so far suggests that you're higher in openness and lower in conscientiousness. But what you need to rectify that if you're if you can rectify it, is a suitably lofty goal. Like, you obviously need a reason. And fair um, enough, you know? So I guess my goal, going to grad school at uh, an Ivy League college. Well, you know, you have a good goal to go to, gra- to a credible graduate school and to pursue an academic career is a good goal. But you also might want to really think hard about what the hell you're going to do if that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you're kind of built for it. So it would be a good pursuit. And, you know, you sound like the kind of guy who could use a PhD. So, well, your questions were smart. You know, I had to listen to them hard, and you thought about them a lot, and they were sophisticated. So, um, you you know, and and that puts you in the top, I don't know, 1% of students, probably something like that. I mean, you've got the right kind of mind for it. And with a mind like that, you, really, you also really want to get yourself disciplined because it's also safer if you have a mind like yours to get disciplined because the problem with a mind like yours is it'll, 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 uh, You'll be chasing it everywhere like someone with an ill, a badly trained bloodhound. Yeah, and that's, that, that can be really hard on a person over time, you know, because it's easy to be one of those people that has a tremendous amount of potential but doesn't have it realized. And boy, that's a rough life by the time you're about 40. I have a wide variety of interests, music, art, 
Yeah, uh, well, that's your very high in yes. openness. Eh? That, that's I've, the trait that's under, that I didn't... So that it's, that's where my yeah. openness is high. So I do have yeah. other opportunities. Well, I, I'm afraid I have to bring our talk to a halt All because right, I have someone nice. else who's right up here. But look, that was really good. Like I said, you know, you're, you've got a good brain, man. So I would suggest that you figure out a good way to use it because you've got, you've got plenty to offer people. And